Sometimes I've asked the question, you look at it and say, is it, is it worth it? And uh, if you've not read John Grisham's book, Skipping Christmas, I recommend that. It's a, it's a funny little parable. It's outstanding. But this guy who's an accountant starts to, to tally everything. And you feel free to elbow your husband like that if you know what he's talking about. It's like, wait a minute, is this worth it? And he goes through and decides, you know, it'd be better we, for, if we, we could cut out half the Christmas budget and go on a cruise the day after Christmas <laughs> and, and, and spend half of what we normally spend. And so they try to systematically completely remove Christmas from his life and anything to do with money and, and spending and, you know, the Christmas celebration. Of course, you'll have to read the book, but he ends up uh, having to come around full circle. It's actually a great, very funny story. But, you know, I've thought about that, too. Have you ever done something and decided... This just wasn't worth it. I think we do that all the time. Uh, we, a few years ago, I, uh, for several years, I've taught at a, uh, the Campus Crusade New Staff Training and taught Bible study methods for the new staff that's coming in and joining staff at the mission organization. And one of the things that, uh, one of the places we'll do that is Campus Crusade's international headquarters is in Orlando. So if you're going to Orlando, do you think of any place you might want to try and go? Yeah, you do. Disney World, okay. It's the happiest place on earth. See, I'm not lying. You can see it in my mouth. It's the happiest place on earth. Well, so we were going there, and we had one day, because I was supposed to um, proceed at my, or uh, preside over my brother's wedding, and so we had, to, we had to fly out of there up to Boston, and so we had this one day in between teaching this class, packing up, going down here, and doing, and I thought, well, that's, that's perfect. It's like it just landed in our laps. We're going to go to the Magic Kingdom. So we did that. And you know what? Uh, it was advertised when you never see crying, screaming children, people sweating, mo- you know, mo- just miserable people uh, on the ads. You, they don't show it. But I tell you what, if you'd taken a picture of me at one point there, <laughs> you would have thought, Bill, what, what happened to you? What was wrong with you? It was uh, hot, exhausting, stressful, expensive and ill-timed. Ever feel that way about something in your life? <laughs> the, next, the next time we were able to go a couple years later, we, did, we said, we're not doing it. I don't care how, how great the ads are, we're not doing that again. And so when we had that, that free day, day off, we went to the beach for part of the day, and we relaxed with our family and actually had a great time and spent close to this. I mean, comparatively, you know, it was just to put the tipping jar out, little gas, you know, burgers on the beach or something. And that was it. And it was, su- I, and as we reflected back, I said, that was such a better investment of our time. Well, every single one of us has been at that place where you've looked. And I think especially we have, I think men have a built-in calculator. We just, we have a return on investment, immediate, you know, little symbol that shows up. And uh, I learned it from my dad. He's a skier and, and there's, and he's also a banker. And there's, there's a thing that you wouldn't know, but it's called runs per dollar. And it, it's not, it's just, it's like how many runs? And it's, it, there's just a denominator and a numerator, and that's how good your day was. Runs per dollar. And I can still hear it today, my dad saying, ski until the lifts close. You're like, okay, you know, I don't care if you're freezing, I don't care what's happened. It's like broken leg, but I still got there. I was the last, we'd brag about it. I was the last one on the lift. Yes, okay, you know, high five. That's how we just... Suck the marrow out of this existence, right? Well, that's, that's, how we naturally, that's how we naturally live. And sometimes I wonder, growing up in the United States, there's definitely some things that are very good about how we've been brought up here and about our culture. And sometimes if you're like I am and you visited other cultures overseas in some different places, you say, wow, this is kind of dark and kind of lost. And then there's times that, uh, I've visited places and say, oh, that's kind of interesting. They have a different take on that. And one of the things that I think has happened to us in America is that uh, our prosperity becomes a weight that all of a sudden we're unable to bear. And we start to buy the brochures and we start to look at those things like the, the Disney World brochure and say, this, this is what it's all about. And if there's anybody here that has never gotten caught up in that, I... I would like to hear your story because this part of being American is getting caught up in the next thing. Dave Barry says that Christmas is a time when we buy electronics we don't need. And, and that, I think, is it's coming up just around the corner. Well, in this passage in Hebrews 11, 
the, the author of Hebrews is talking about Moses. And he's talking about, really, he's asking that question, is it worth it? The whole chapter of Hebrews 11, you've probably heard it called the Hall of Faith. It's story after story, especially with Abraham. But talking about men and women who believed God rather than buying into the brochure, rather than believing the world. They believed God. And, and the question becomes, is it worth it? And I think this is a question that we can answer as our nation. This is a question we answer as a congregation. And this is a question that bores to the core of our hearts. Someday, we're going to be trying to an- look, looking back and answering that question. Was this worth it? Was it all worth it? And I believe that it is worth it to be a Christian, to be in Christ. It's worth it to choose God over the world. It's worth it to choose God over the world. The first thing I want to draw your attention, I'm going to reread this passage so we can look at it, but it says by, in, in uh, verse 24, By faith Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endorsed as I'm sorry, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. And I'm reading from the uh, English Standard Version. I'm not sure what we have up there, but um, <clears throat> someone's messing with me here. Right? <laughs> okay. The first point is that Moses refused his worldly birthright and chose to suffer with the people of God. This is about choosing God's path rather than man's path. And I think these choices come up, they, sometimes they're big and sometimes they're little small choices. Choosing God over man. And I thought and thought about this because, you know, when I say it that way, it sounds so darn spiritual. I mean, you almost want to roll your R's when you say it, you know. Rather than choosing men, I chose the way of the Lord. Oh, very, very good. You're so spiritual. But when does that actually take place? Well, I'm going to go back to the brochure example. There, there is a, a worldview and a water that we swim in, an air that we breathe, that basically says, this is the way life is. This is what you're meant to do. And I, I remember as a young man feeling uh, at a point that, that there's a point when uh, I, I was in college and I actually wondered... Oh, Every girl around here is so cute. I, I wonder if I got a problem with my brain. You know, <laughs> they're they're all so cute, and you you think what's wrong with me? And the world says, well, that's that's it. You know, you need to you need to soak that in. You not, you, you you need to go after girl after girl after girl, and and uh, and that's a good thing. Let's focus in on just the external physical beauty of a girl. That's what it's all about. Well, you know what? If you're a guy. And if you're a girl, that's emptiness, ultimately. That, that, there's not, no greater statement from the world than something that you look like or what somebody else looks like is, is the most important thing about them and how important that is. The Bible says that man looks to the outward appearance, but God looks to the heart. Well, this is a faith choice for me. Am I willing to believe Scripture? And say, well, I'm, I'm going to do what I'm going to do what the Bible teaches, or am I going to say, no, nah, I'm kind of z- zeroing in here. Let me let me do a uh, let me do an error test. No, it thinks about how we look. Pretty sure of that you know, if you search deep inside yourself, uh, sometimes you 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 can hear the voice of God, and sometimes you're just going to hear yourself. You know, I think that's the discernment that needs to happen. But it's about choosing God's path over man's uh, man's path. And it's, it's not just about the have-tos, but it's about the want-tos. You know, ultimately, what God wants to do in us is to create a people, a redeemed people, that are sharing His heart for His purposes and His kingdom in this world. It's not just a self-improvement plan, and it's not, it's not just for me. I, you know, I, before I found God, I wasn't getting anywhere in my life and career. But now that I'm a Christian... Boy, the money's just flowing in, isn't it? That's not exactly the, the way it works. And if you've ever thought of it that way, you know, it might actually work for a while because biblical principles do lead in godliness. With godliness, there's great gain and contentment. 
But, there's, but that's not God's plan for us. That's not why he's giving us these things. But he wants to transform our heart. He wants to take our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. He wants, as, as Jesus uh, spoke in the Sermon on the Mount, he took the outward laws that were on the Ten Commandments and he took them inward. It's pretty easy to follow an outward commandment, isn't it? You can, you can just do it. It's like stand here. Okay, I'm standing. Great. Sit. Okay, I'm sitting. Do this. Give 10%. Okay, I'll do that. We can do the things and we can check it off the list. But I tell you what, Jesus starts talking about our heart. You've heard it said, don't murder. I say whoever hates his brother has committed murder in his heart. And I wrestled with that for years. Well, this is, this, you know, you just kind of almost want to throw the paper up and, and walk away. Well, I can't do that. Uh, I've, you know, do you remember Richard Simmons? Somebody does. Inside every large person is a little thin person waiting to get out, right? <laughs> well, I'd say inside of, of me, of this godly Christian man, is a, is a snide, sniveling, little, petty person just crying to get out and complain about this or that. And it's, he's in there, and I have to beat him back every day, and often multiple times a day, down. And I joke all the time, but remember the little cartoon characters in the old cartoons? There's a little angel and the little devil. I mean, that's me. That's my whole dialogue. You just, you'd laugh if you heard it. It's like, say it, say it. No, don't say it. Please don't say it. You know, like, it happens all the time. But that's an inward heart wrestle. And Jesus is going to take our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. And let me just ask you, at the deepest core level of who you are, do you want that to happen to you? I think sometimes I, I cling and I don't really want that to happen. I think that's a question worth, worth asking. Lord, have your way with me. We sing it, but do we, do we mean it? I think that's that question that we need to return to over and over and over. Lord, do you, will you have your way with me? Will you make my heart to reflect your heart so that my will is like yours? Well, God's path is often at odds with not only sinful pleasure, but with worldly strategy. And this is where you, you start meddling a little bit. Because sometimes God's will doesn't make sense. I mean, think about where Moses was. He had been raised and had the privilege of being a son of the Pharaoh. I mean, presumably he was in line to be the king someday. That is, talk about strategic, you know, isn't that a strategic place? <laughs> Maybe being, what, if, what if we had someone that, that you, you realize they were, uh, they were in line and you could kind of, they're being groomed and they're, they're a great man of God and they're in line to possibly become the president of the United States. Do you think we could use a godly man in the, in the presidency? You know, sometime, maybe, this millennium? I don't know. I think we could. But what if, what if that man had a call on God's life that was other than that? I'd have a hard time with that, I think. It's like, no, 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 no. Look at the significance of this. This is really strategic. And, and don't get me wrong. This, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here. Because I, I come from a campus ministry background that's, every, hey, let's try it. Let's give it a shot. Let's try something new. Let's, do, let's, let's give it a shot, okay? I just watched a, a movie with my, uh, with my ministry leadership class called The Gospel Blimp. It's a satire from 1961. It's classic Christian-made B-movie, and it's, it's so B that it's funny, you know? It's, it's, but it's, it makes an incredible point. These guys decide they want to reach the community, and so they buy this old uh, Army surplus blimp. And, uh, and they start putting gospel messages on it, you know, like, repent. And, and so they fly it around. And the, the joke is that the one guy drops out of that and actually leads his neighbor to Christ by going and spending the day with him at the beach. You know, and that, and these, things, these things happen. But we get these grand scheme, and you can just see it's the satire. It's just like we think. So my, my point here isn't to throw everything under the bus. I mean, we, sooner or later, you've got to decide if you're going to get together. And you've got to decide if you're going to do something at all. And so by all means, let's think strategically. But don't think that the, the bottom line for God is, is just common sense strategy. Sometimes he's calling us to be set apart in a very distinct way. Frankly, I think pulling out of Hollywood is one of the, one of the things that cr- Christians sh- should not have done to the extent that they did. And now people are trying to get back in in different ways. And I think that's good. It's, a, it's, it's good to have Christian influence 
but not necessarily for everyone. And how do we decide on that? Well, perhaps you've heard the story of uh, Father Damien. He was a Belgian priest who went to Hawaii, and in 1873 he moved out to the island of Molokai. And he said this, I make myself a leper with the lepers to gain all to Jesus Christ. You see, Molokai at that time was, had been established as a leper colony. And I would think, you know, my, in fact, my wife and I have joked about this sometimes. Uh, you know, do you, think they need, do you think they need a pastor in Hawaii someplace? They've got to need somebody over there, you know. Let's, let's go there. Well, that's, he had the gig. You know, he had it. He could surf, you know, if he wanted to, take a donkey cart on his mission rounds and hit the North Shore on a good windy day, you know. But he, he could do that stuff. He chose to go out to the leper colony that had been segregated for the sake of the, of the health of the normal people or the, the un, uninfected people and to live with them on the le, in the leper colony. And, you know, he lived and worked among them. He preached to them and served them and led them. He cleaned up the colony. He, he rebuilt shacks and painted it. Um, see, ladies, we could, they painted even on the leper colony they were painting his... Um, but they made it nice, and, and one day he stuck his foot in, in a, 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 he was preparing a bath and stuck his foot in scalding water, and it blistered, and he realized he didn't feel it at all. He realized he himself had contracted leprosy. And the next message that he gave to the leper colony, he began with the words, my fellow lepers. He had literally given his life for those that he was serving. So, I think if we were to ask him, is it worth it to choose God over the world, he would have said, yes, it is. In fact, he did say that. It's worth it to choose God in his ways over the world. And I think those people that were in the leper colony also would have felt that way. Thank you for coming to us. If you've ever been really down and really out of it and really in a situation where you're in desperate need, and if you've ever been there, maybe it's just something as as simple as uh, getting a flat tire someplace, and you realize you don't have cell coverage, and you don't have uh, you, you don't have a tire spare tire. It happened to my kids one time when our older daughter was driving our other kids back from Oregon, the middle of Burns or around there, not in the middle of Burns, but somewhere between Burns and Ben. And uh, there was a guy that stopped and let them it helped them change their tire and let them use his cell phone. Do you think I was thankful for that? <laughs> I tell you what, when we can help people in situations, whether it's something very practical like that or something deeper like a leper colony or even something as simple as extending the grace and love of Jesus Christ, we're able to speak the truth and love to them. That speaks in to people's lives. So Moses refused his worldly birthright. And maybe you have a worldly birthright of sorts. Maybe it's literal or maybe it's just sort of figurative. You've got a spot in this world and you just you can't say no to that. You just, you just can't say no to it. Well, sometimes God asks us to jettison things for something greater. And it, even though it's hard for I'm a, I'm a garage sale guy, it's hard for me to get away of things that get rid of things that um, my wife would broadly categorize as junk, but I see as really good projects. These are good. I have a table saw that is 175 years old, I think, and uh, and. Uh, She says, you sure you might want to get rid of that? And why don't you get a good new one? Because I can fix this one. I see the potential. It'll probably take another $700 and four experts. But I think I can fix it. Uh, Maybe we need to jettison some of those things. Is there something in your life that you maybe need to jettison? Or just ask God. God, as you're changing my heart, would you change my heart about this thing or this project or this position or this relationship? What is it that he's got in your life that possibly he wants to redirect you in. Secondly, Moses considered the reproach and reward of Christ as greater than wealth. It's interesting because the reproach of Christ, it's really interesting to me that we will honor and glorify Christ as king, and he's the greatest uh, greatest, um, being. He's He's beautiful beyond description. We love him, we serve him, we worship him, and we're ashamed of him. Right? I mean, that's little, this little guy over here. It's like, shut your yapper. Don't say anything about it. These people aren't Christians. They won't know what you're talking about. You know, wherever I am, 
And, I, and, and, and it's natural for me to feel that way. Why? Because it is foolishness to the Greeks, the, the philosophers, the really, really smart people of the day. Who are the really, really smart people today? You know? Anyone? Shout it out. Well, that is the right answer. I love that. Jesus is the really smart one today. In fact, in my readings in philosophical theology, uh, Jesus is claimed to be the, the smartest human that ever lived, and I believe it. Today's culture, though, says the scientists are the smartest people. And it's amazing. One book I just read says, you know, there's not even a, descri- there's not even a legitimate definition of science. You know, people say science, and it's like it's God. Well, what are you talking about? The empirical method or just basic rationality? Well, guess what? We use that every day. So what is this science? It's become this God, and, and you look to see if people in science, what do they say about God? And, and can we believe it? Is that true? Well, I think sometimes uh, we need to stand strong, and I think we also need to stand humbly. And, you know, my job is not to tear somebody down because they they are having a hard time believing in Christ because they believe in science. But it is my job to be ready to give a defense for the hope that is within me. And I don't want to be ashamed. Even Paul had to write it out. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. If you have something that powerful, let's not be ashamed of it. Now, I'm not saying that means let's be as obnoxious as we can. But I am saying, there's, if, if, well, let's put it this way. If you're 100% in everything you ever try, my guess is you're not really being challenged enough. I mean, if, if, uh, if you make every single basket, the basket's too low. Let, let, let's change the game a little bit and have something where, where we actually have a challenge. If every single thing you ever do or say with someone, is, it, there's a response of immediate human success with the gospel, my guess is you're, you're, you're probably not sharing it enough. Take it, let me just challenge you to take it out on a limb a little bit. Just go, and usually, that doesn't mean you have to be obnoxious or anything, but just ask a question. Have you ever thought about things on a spiritual side of life? Or did you grow up having any spiritual influence from your parents or grandparents? These are basic questions you can ask someone just to open the door to find out. If you make that a regular practice, can I do this, God? Okay. With God as my witness, I think he would, but I'm going to try to guarantee you that over time you're going to see some amazing things happen that you never, ever would have seen happen apart from that. That sooner or later, you may not get a story every time, you may not get a life change every time, but you'll get a chance to see someone who will say later, thank you for asking me that. And they're way more willing to talk about it than we are normally. And I know what it's like. I grew up conservative Christian. Um, you know, no premarital sex because that leads to dancing. You know, I grew up that. That's the, that's, <laughs> so I, I, I understand. And I understand what it's like to feel like a martyr and separated kind of my whole existence. You know, growing up through school, I'm the Christian, you know. <laughs> And trying to, trying, to, trying to fit in with people and trying to, trying to have friends. And, and then they're good. We can do a sleepover Saturday night. But they're coming to church with me if they're sleeping over here. And if I'm over there, they're picking me up and we're going to church. You know, that's just part of... And, and that, those things as a kid, sometimes that feels a little weird. So I don't want to do things that's going to highlight my weirdness to people. I think one of the things that happens, thankfully, when you become a dad, I think your weirdness meter just kind of falls off the table. You know, it's like, whatever. So I'm weird. I'm a dad. I'm fine with that. But I, want, I don't want to be weird for the sake of being weird. That's what John Ortberg says. Sometimes it's like if we can't be holy, we, we'll just settle for being weird. You know, let's not do that. Let's be holy and reach out. Well, there's a now and there's a not yet involved in this process of trusting God and believing that his rewards and that reproach, that embarrassment of being a part of Christ, that the rewards are actually worth it. You know, one of, the, one of the shows my wife and I have watched um, is a thing called Fixer Upper. And it's on, it's on HGTV, for those of you who don't know what that is. It's just like ESPN, only it's no sports at all. So um, it's all home stuff. And, 
And they, they, they take a couple who knows how to fix up homes, and they'll choose three homes with the potential buyers, and they're just dumps. I mean, they're run-down places, and you look at it, and, and you suck in your breath, and you go, oh, 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 and they'll show them peeling off, you know, formica, and there's rot, and there's water damage, and there's animals and infestations and things. There's paint and dilapidated siding and everything. And, the, and then they'll, they'll propose to them a... Uh, a, a solution and say, well, here's what we can do. You can buy this at this much, and then we can put this much into it, and this is gonna, what it's going to look like. And it's really interesting to me because it's the best when they take the worst property. I mean, that's really fun. I, and my wife and I'll sit there and root for them. Oh, take that one. Take that one. You know, because we know what they're going to do with it when they rejuvenate it. But what's also really interesting is different personality types are, are visionaries in different ways. And I'm a little bit more artistic, so I can kind of see something transformed. There's some people on that show that have zero ability to visualize anything. And they ju- you can just see them just like, I just don't see. That, that, that's really messy. It's like, yeah, well, we're going to change that. But it's just, oh, it's just terrible. I, there's just terrible. I can't, I can't invest in this property. It's so bad and ugly and tragic. And they say, just trust me. We're going to put this, yeah, that, what you're talking about, I know that that's going to go away. Oh, I just can't see it. And then by the end of the show, if they pick that worst property, it's been completely transformed, and they, they show them looking at it for the first time, and they usually squeal out or cry or something like that. It's fun to, it's fun to watch. But you know what? I, I think of this world, and I think of our own lives even, as kind of that fixer-upper. God's trying to do something in us, but the problem is we don't do a very good job seeing it. We don't see the finished product very well. You know, C.S. Lewis said, if we were able to see someone, a human being, a Christian, in their ultimate glorified state, it would be something we'd be tempted to stand down or to to kneel down and worship. It would be that great of a being. Uh, We're we're created in the image of God, and when we're fully glorified, we're going to be people who are magnificent when we're finished, when he's finished with us. Right now, some of us have some bad siding. (laughs) You know, my paint's flaking a little bit. But can we trust in him, the master architect, the master builder, the great physician? Can we trust in him to take us there? Or are we going to trust in in kind of our plan, our plan B? This is what we do. This is how we do it. Well, until we fully tap in to this later reward... I'm talking heavenly reward. We'll never be able to fully obey because there's just not enough take home. There's not enough in this life to reward us right now for everything we're taking part in. You know, I did, I did a, that debate with the, the atheist um, in, uh, just a few weeks ago, and the saddest thing to me was the entire foundation for his whole worldview. And it was... We just pursue happiness. If we can pursue happiness, then, then that's what's going to be our guiding light. That's what's going to take us where we need to go and, what we, and to do what we need to do. I thought, you know, that's just so shallow. I mean, it, it sounds okay for me to kind of do, you know, e pluribus unum, great, that's, I'll bless you in that. Go, be warm and be filled, go do it. And does that sound great? Yeah, go, be happy. I want you to be happy. And obviously, I don't want you here uh, us, I don't want us not to be happy, especially in, in, the, in the idea that we're going to be a flourishing, healthy human being who is in Christ and who's serving him. I think that's genuine happiness, and it's what Lewis described as joy. But I think that, that shallow happiness, it's a short road. Or you could say it's a long, long road, and it's a hard road. There's no real deep, lasting joy. Every single one of us knows the joy that you feel when you've given of yourself for the sake of Christ to love someone else, knowing that they can't return that here on this earth. There's a joy in that that fills you up. And what, what bothers me is that people will try to talk themselves out of that because the world is advertising a different storyline. Like, no, 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 That's, you're, you're a chump. I don't know if people use that word anymore, but I still do in my mind because I never wanted to be a chump. You know, a chump was the stupid loser that showed up and, Paid for the, paid too much for the Carnival Barker's, uh, you know, blender at the fair or whatever it was. 
And I don't want to be a chump who buys into a lie and then ends up my whole life has lived that way. Well, you know, who's, who's really the chump? According to Scripture, to be a chump means to disregard God's Word and to not follow Him. The ones who actually listen and obey and humble themselves in the sight of the Lord and, and uh, lean not on their own understanding, but in all their ways acknowledge Him, those are the ones who have straight paths. Even if it doesn't look like it, right now on this earth. It's always got to be linked in some way to ultimate and eternal joy. Chesterton uh, said that the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. And I just want to admonish you again this morning that refocus. This is not a losing effort to be a part of Christ's kingdom and to love him and serve him for who he is and to, to recalibrate, recalibrate your life along his path. This is actually uh, the path that's hard, but it's the deep path of deep joy. Well, we talked about um, he refused his birthright, and then he considered the reproach and reward as greater than just wealth on this earth. But then Moses obeyed without fear because he saw the invisible God. So... Just see the invisible God, will you? That simple, right? I mean, if you're like I am, that's a little bit of a head scratcher. Isn't this kind of what it all boils down to in this life? We're serving an invisible God, and science is laughing and covering his mouth, or maybe not covering his mouth, but laughing and pointing a finger. Science. and, And says there's no God out there, and yet we're following a God that's invisible. And you know what? If you've ever gotten in a discussion with somebody like that, you can find yourself kind of going in circles. And, and it, is, it can be frustrating. Let me say, first of all, I'm not going to go there this morning, but there are very solid, sound, rational reasons for believing uh, from a rational base in the existence of God. In fact, I would say that the rationally uh, and stepping out from it, you look at it and there has to be a God. And the God that there must be, surprisingly, shockingly, lines up with the personal God that's revealed in our scriptures. So, whew, oh, good. But, but if you want to be biased against it, it's, you can't be convinced. But I would say rationally, but that's not usually our problem. Our problem, I believe, has more to do with sight, and it has to do with trust. So how do we see God when we're blind? It's not a blind faith, but it's a faith that trusts in him. And we have to take the evidences that have been brought into our own lives. Well, I think scripture is is a strong evidence. If you trace the storyline of scripture and look at how God has brought his people unto himself, then really, historically, the, the Jews had no business being any kind of people. Chuck Colson said, you know, if I would have chosen somebody, I would have chosen the Egyptians. I mean, they had promise. They had leadership. They had organization. These Jews, I mean, sometimes you're, you, you want to do a character study out of some of the, the Israel, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and, you know, you're afraid your kids are going to ask you pointed questions about it. <laughs> like, well, don't or just, or, well, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> I mean, they did some embarrassing, shameful things. They, uh, the, you know, God had his hand on them, and he said, I'm not going to let you go. And, you know, after Christ came and he said in John 6 and John 10, he said, my sheep hear my voice and no one can snatch you out of my hand. It's still his business to watch over his people, even when we mess up, even when we're not, uh, we're hoping that nobody does a character study on us anytime soon. But we infer him through creation. We read him in scripture. We experience him in loving relationships and we sense him in our hearts. And I think all of those things are valid and they should all fit together. Uh, The Berean Christians search the scriptures. Uh, Test the spirits. Test the spirits and and figure this out. Uh, How do we test the spirits? I don't have time to go into this right now, but I will just say, ask yourself, does this exalt Christ? Is this focused on eternal results? In other words, not just health and wealth or something akin to it. And is this in the Bible? Look for things that go along with Scripture. Look for things that exalt Christ. And if it starts to undermine any of those things, I would, I would be concerned. Maybe take into a little bit more counsel as to whether God's really speaking something to you in any particular situation. 
But you know, Henry Blackaby says the greatest dangers for apostasy are not departing from God to a distant shore, but moving half a degree away from where God wants you to be. I didn't want to be the one to say that, so I quoted Henry Blackaby, (laughs) because I know that's hard to hear, isn't it? Because you think, you know, generally, I'm, I'm really good at the kind of the eagle's view of things. Generally, pretty good. You know, here's where we're going. There's a mountain there, a mountain here, and we're kind of going there through the mountains. Well, then we say, are you a half a degree off from God's will for you? <laughs> well, you know, it's hard to explain when there's difficulties in science. Uh, you know, I'll try to explain it away. But, you know, that, that's, that's a heart-searching kind of thing. That's where I need God to, again every day, every morning. Please replace that heart of stone. Or the dross that hardens over the precious metal. You scrape that dross away. Lord, will you, will you scrape the dross off of, off of my heart? Return me. Melt my heart. Soften the fallow ground. Give me, uh, give me that, that soft heart, that heart of flesh. Well, I'd like to say this morning that it's worth it to choose God over the world. It's worth it to choose God over the world. It's worth it in some degree now because there's joy in the process. It does actually work. I mean, it's pragmatic for his purposes. But ultimately, there's a great reward for, it, for us. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can conceive of the things that God has prepared for those who love him. So if you can think of something, it's already automatically disqualified. You know? So go ahead and think of Disneyland right now. It's out. Thank you. If heaven was Disneyland, that would be hard for me. That would be a hard one. Um, But that we have an ultimate reward. And I think we tap in moment by moment. We tap in day by day, month by month, year by year. And ultimately, every single moment is connected to that eternal perspective in Christ. So that when I greet you this morning or you greet each other or you stop and help someone that slid off the road or whatever, you're thinking not just of them, but I think you, you want to think of them and care, but you're also thinking this is an eternal event right now. And there's a good chance that someday God's going to be smiling not just now but in eternity for that. It's like, man, that was great when you helped that person. And not, not just for the rewards, but I think you've got to believe they're true and because the Bible says they're true and they're real, that this is our ultimate reality. So I know, okay, spending the day on a beach in Florida was not actually a martyrdom for me <laughs> instead of going to Disneyland. You're like, yeah, Bill, how about, you know, maybe a little harder. Well, I knew a gal that was uh, in college and she was uh, teaching or she was studying to be a PE teacher and uh, her emphasis was dance and she loved dance and really she had already kind of died to that dream because they didn't have a dance program at her school and state school in california and so she uh said well i'll just do pe and you can have an emphasis and you can take all the dance classes we have and that and so she she loved that and she was able to land a really good gig through a series of events she ended up being able to audition and being one of the key performers in this big musical review at bush gardens uh to be televised a lot of big people with their agents were there, and she kind of slipped right in and, and auditioned well and, and got the part. It was kind of kind of big stuff. And uh, as she was there and getting, but wasn't too many rehearsals into it, where she started to realize, you know what, this is not the right place for me. There, there is an atmosphere that is just pressing down on my soul. And she said, you know, I thought about, you know, should I be a light? Uh, maybe I'll be the one to be here and be a light. And I think that's a legitimate thought. But she realized for, for where she was and who she was that she felt like th- it was going to be like a bunch of dirt being thrown over her light. She didn't think she, 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 I just, she knew she shouldn't be a part of that. Well, she had a lot of support to be there, but she didn't have a lot of support to pull out. In fact, the... Uh, the man who uh, led the whole thing was irate with her and said, you'll never work in this town again. This town being the entire greater Los Angeles area. <laughs> so that's kind of a threat. And she just had to say, well, then so be it. She ended up getting a job with uh, a retirement hospital where she did the linens. And you can imagine that wasn't exactly the same as being on stage in a musical review. 
It's, you might call that a little more on the lowly side. Um, she used the word gross. <laughs> There's definitely aspects of that. But she said, you know, she, she got her friend the job there too, and the two of them worked together, and they met a, a couple of uh, young men from Vietnam. And they could hardly speak English, but they were learning. And they started taking them to some of their uh, activities with their college group. And by the end of the summer, both these young men had come to Christ. And her mom wasn't even happy with her. She remembers sitting, watching the production on the television, and just kind of feeling the, you know, her mom loved musicals, loved performance, that, and she just kind of felt that, a little bit of that expectation that she disappointed. But, you know, I believe in the long run that was worth it. And it was that exact heart that came through in this young woman when I met her later on and asked her to be my wife. That's, that's the kind of heart that I saw. I think it was worth it. She would tell you now that was one of the best decisions she ever made, as hard as it was to make it. Well, is it worth it to choose God over the world? I'm going to say yes. But you know what? In a certain regard, it doesn't really matter what I say because I can take you this far, but you've got to leave here today and there's a part in your heart that between you and God alone, you have to be able to nod and say, God, it's worth it. Will you take me there? Let's pray. Father in heaven, it's wonderful to be your child. It's also a challenge. And I'm weak. We're weak. We're blind. We don't listen very well. We don't obey very well. God, I pray that you will just take us into your arms. Show us who you really are. Give us an experience of your love through this body, through your word, and through the inner testimony of the Holy Spirit on our very hearts. And would you melt our hearts so that we could see that it really is worth it to choose God over the world. Amen.